Judge Eileen Cannon, you have unsuspected depth. Trump's appointee has stunned Trump world by not only limiting what he can say and when he can say it during his prosecution and trial for stealing our top secret documents, but also for limiting when he and his lawyers can see the war plans and other classified information he stole. This has gotten buried under the McCarthy illegal impeachment inquiry, which is the point of that inquiry. It is a diversion to misdirect the American news media and the public. And as we know all too well, if you spend 90 seconds trying to misdirect the American news media, you will succeed utterly. But Trump has been counting on Eileen Cannon to do his bidding for him. And in this first non-timing ruling out of Jack Smith's Florida case against Trump, the judge has given us hope that she may yet turn out to be more than just the former flamenco dancing and yoga correspondent of the Miami El Nuevo Herald newspaper. In short... Cannon's ruling is almost everything Jack Smith asked for. Any evidence marked classified, Trump cannot discuss it publicly. The evidence marked classified that Trump has lied about and said he declassified, Trump cannot discuss that publicly. The evidence marked classified that has become public knowledge without being officially declassified, Trump cannot discuss that publicly either. Trump wanted a skiff a sensitive, compartmented information facility, SCIF, reinstalled at Mar-a-Lago, and Cannon not only did not give it to him, she has ignored the request. Looks like when he or his attorneys want access to these documents, they will have to go to an established skiff under the control of a classified information security officer already assigned to the case in Florida. Trump can only look at the secrets he stole inside the skiff. He can only talk to his defense team about the secrets he stole inside the skiff. For the classified audio recordings, Trump cannot have copies. He cannot listen to them except on a standalone computer, not attached to a network, without Wi-Fi, without internet, inside the skiff, and the headphones on which he listens to the audio recordings cannot be wireless. They have to be plugged into the computer. Honest to God, Judge Cannon's order includes every protection against Trump's kleptomania except requiring him to leave a credit card at the desk. And it has a sting in its tail, and that sting is not merely be kind, please rewind. Quote, the limitations on disclosure of classified information set forth in this order are binding on defendant and his counsel, and violations may result in criminal and or civil penalties. In short, Trump could go to jail for stealing these documents, and he could also go to jail for stealing them again. And he could also also go to jail for talking about them. And wait, there's more. His Florida co-defendant, Walt Nauta, in this equation, the sap. Walt Nauta figured he could serve his lord and master Trump yet one more time by gaining his own access to the classified documents. And who knows where they'd wind up then? Judge Cannon shot that down, too, with the impeccable logic that since Nauta is charged with obstruction and lying and not secret stealing, quote, the defense may not disclose classified information to him. From the Georgia Trump case, Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, continues to be the Aaron Rodgers of defendants. Only it's as if Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles 94 seconds into the first game and then tore it again 94 seconds into the second game and 94 seconds into the third and 94 seconds into the fourth. Meadows wanted the case against him frozen, delayed indefinitely from its scheduled start next month while he appealed his last loss and again tried to get his case moved to federal court. But U.S. District Judge Steve Jones not only denied it, but basically added, uh, you're going to tear your Achilles again. You know that, right? Saying Meadows, quote, has shown no likelihood on prevailing on the merits of his appeal. As to the parallel issue before Judge Tanya Chutkin in Trump's Washington trial, quote, the defendant's daily extrajudicial statements that threaten to prejudice the jury pool in this case, per the only non-sealed part of Jack Smith's exchange with Trump lawyer number, wait a minute, 236, John Loro, 
Nothing leaked yesterday. Loro's team was supposed to answer the judge about good old ECF number 47-3 on Monday. Smith's team was supposed to answer Loro's answer yesterday. And we don't know for sure that any of that has even happened, let alone what did happen. And of course, we don't even know what good old ECF number 47-3 is. It's all under seal. And of course, you heard about none of this because A, Trump may have actually realized how bad the news from Judge Cannon is for him, and he should not call attention to it on social media. And B, the news media saw something else move in the bushes, and collectively it cried, look, a kitty. And C, Trump is, after all, occupied engineering Kevin McCarthy's illegal impeachment inquiry. That's the point. We know from a hundred different reports that Trump met Sunday in New Jersey with the lawn ornament come to life, Marjorie Taylor Greene. He spoke with the snake-like Elise Stefanik on Tuesday after McCarthy took the bait and announced his star chamber. But he has not been in contact with the Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert because she's been too busy getting kicked out of the stage version of Beetlejuice for vaping and illegally recording the show. And of course, she's now preoccupied with her GoFundMe campaign to get herself a dress that actually fits. Trump has evidently not talked directly with McCarthy either, which makes sense because McCarthy is also very busy destroying his own career and his party's majority in the House. The illegal impeachment investigation has now morphed into the GOP in crisis, in fact, into the GOP in open revolt. McCarthy accused Congressman Matt Gaetz of Florida of conspiring with Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California to get Swalwell placed back on the Intelligence Committee. McCarthy even posits that that is a front for something else. He won't say what. He says of Gates, quote, this is really about an ethics complaint. Gates came back last night and said, this is an abject lie from a sad and pathetic man who lies to hold on to power, unquote. And Congressman, you're going to have to be more specific than that and use the speaker's name in that statement, because otherwise that could be about just about anybody in your own party, couldn't it? It is hard to imagine Matt Gates being right about anything, but he actually may be in this case. McCarthy's wafer-thin premise for this charade is coming apart like a cheap suit. And for that matter, McCarthy is coming apart like a cheap suit. There are now dueling FBI whistleblowers in the Hunter Biden case, and it is beginning to look like McCarthy's FBI whistleblower is a liar. It was Gary Shapley who said that Hunter Biden prosecutor David Weiss had proclaimed he was being stymied by the Justice Department. But now it is the chief of the FBI's Hunter Biden investigation, Thomas Subasinski, who says, no, that's not true. Weiss never said that. In fact, he told the House in an interview those exact things last week. And McCarthy went ahead with this sham anyway. Just to ratchet this up a little bit more, late last night, and I'll read this directly from the pages of the Washington Examiner, a curiously useful resource from the far right, quote, Hunter Biden filed a lawsuit against a former Trump administration aide in California federal court Wednesday, alleging he illegally posted contents of his, that would be Hunter Biden's, infamous laptop from hell. The lawsuit accuses Garrett Ziegler, his company, and 10 unnamed defendants, make one of them Trump, make one of them Trump, make one of them Trump, of improperly accessing, tampering with, manipulating, altering, copying, and damaging computer data that they did not own in violation of California's computer fraud laws. I sentence you to 10 years in prison for damaging the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop. Back at the ranch, Kevin McCarthy's entire motive for this perversion of justice and the degradation of the seemingly nothing left to be degraded in Republican House, that is also collapsing. He did this to save his worthless ass and push through spending legislation, 
appropriations bills and another stunt shutdown of the government. And every one of the bills, from a mega bill to individual funding procedures for the Pentagon, for disaster relief, for Homeland Security, they all failed yesterday. He had to pull the $826 billion Pentagon bill off the floor. Half the members are trying to stick amendments and pet projects onto it. And the last word was McCarthy was even pivoting away from the big musical number they have all rehearsed, the September 30th government shutdown. And instead, they may just pass a short term continuing resolution just to keep the government afloat into next month. No more big musical number. All he's got is a kazoo. Plus, rather surprisingly, Institutional Washington is actually beating the crap out of Kevin McCarthy. The inquiry, quote, devalues impeachment as a meaningful tool to deal with genuine presidential misconduct. Professor Emeritus Frank O. Bowman of Missouri Law told as button down a group as you can find the publication Roll Call. Bowman wrote a history of impeachments. He says what McCarthy did may, quote, create a situation where presidents of both parties just throw up their hands and say, look, these guys never operate in good faith. We're just going to refuse any subpoenas that they send us, unquote. The first president who tries that will get away with it. I don't know what happens to the second one. Let's see if Biden becomes the first. A UNC law professor went even further in the same publication. There's, quote, no evidence whatsoever. It's an outcome in search of a process. Isn't that perfect? It's an outcome in search of a process. McCarthy literally brought trouble on his own house, and this is the wind he has inherited. And yes, it is Trump's wind. And yes, that is is exactly as disgusting as it sounds. And to mix my metaphors, the quicksand McCarthy now finds himself in may only be up to his ankles now, but it could go all the way to the top of his beak. McCarthy could lose the speakership over this. And as I pointed out yesterday in the 1998 Newt Gingrich history story, it could happen damned fast. I mean, it is so bad, even news reporters are noticing. Well, kind of. The White House actually figured out bless them, that there are Pavlovian bells you can ring inside the D.C. political media industrial complex. White House Counsel Office spokesman Ian Sams wrote a long letter excoriating the stenography of the last few, well, what's the right word here, weeks, months, centuries? Quote, it's time for the media to ramp up its scrutiny of House Republicans for opening an impeachment inquiry based on lies. He added that the absence of, you know, evidence should, quote, set off alarm bells for news organizations. And then he named the news organizations and nothing scares an outlet like CNN more than seeing itself ripped in a letter that was sent to all the other news organizations that it secretly still envies. Mr. Sams was smart enough to leak the letter Tuesday night, then deliver it Wednesday morning, then post it in full online Wednesday afternoon. If today he's standing in front of Washington Union Station handing it out to passersby, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. And it seems to have registered with the media. Again, kinda. The letter noted, as I did yesterday, that on the first of this month, Kevin McCarthy insisted, all but swore in an interview with Breitbart News, that if there were to be an impeachment inquiry, it would follow a House vote of some kind. Quote, if we move forward with an impeachment inquiry, it would occur through a vote on the floor of the People's House and not through a declaration by one person. And then he made a declaration by one person. So... When McCarthy met reporters yesterday and expected the usual supine enabling of his crap machine, he was stunned when one of them from CNN actually quoted that Breitbart quote to him. As you will hear, Kevin McCarthy had no idea what to do next and several times had to go back to the beginning of his memorized statement. But you told Breitbart 12 days ago that you had a vote, so what changed? You know what's interesting to me? You were a reporter for CNN, correct? Yes. I just laid out to you a lot of allegations 
based upon the American I'm public. I'm just about your word. Why did you change your word? Okay, well, let, let, me, let me answer your question, because I've answered it every single day, and you could answer me every single day. Nancy Pelosi changed the president of this house. But that was this doesn't Walt preclude Reagan. from a... Nancy Pelosi changed the president of this house on September 24th. It was withheld and good enough for every single Democrat here. It was good enough for the judge. Why would it have to be different today? What we've learned in the last couple weeks, wouldn't you want to know the answer to? Your whole job is reporting. You now have an accusation that the president took a bribe. You do know from your own reporting, from your own station, that they were selling a brand. You do know from your own reporting from CNN that the president went to and did conference calls, that the president went to lunches and dinners, just the dinners, and, the, and Hunter got a new Porsche. He got three but points for the but vote. I, that's but, that, but, that, but that's my question to you. Why don't you ask the other questions? Why don't you I want do to ask? No, you, do, you never you change your position. I never change my position. You, you don't, don't, you don't want days ago. You know what's interesting to me? Vote. So you don't care about any of the answers. That's you are very interested in the whole process. Yes, I answered your question. Of course, McCarthy lied there several times. Nancy Pelosi held a vote in 2019 before the impeachment began. He also never got around to actually answering CNN about his own lying. It was rather an impressive performance, especially when he had to go back to the beginning. I have noted before that Kevin McCarthy looks like the bird that has just smashed into your window. During that one, he looked like he had just done it twice. While I suspect the McCarthy illegal impeachment inquiry will soon consume his speakership and within days the media may be climbing over each other to help him bury himself, I am not suddenly going all Pollyanna on the utter failure of American journalism, especially American television journalism, especially American broadcast network television journalism in the last eight years and eight months and the last eight minutes. You will recall that the night before the Republican debate in Milwaukee, three Trump hoodlums, led by that disgusting Jason Miller, were, according to Politico, quote, whining and dining. Twelve national political reporters at a steakhouse in Milwaukee called Rare. Now, these were not a dozen frauds from Fox News, The Daily Caller, Newsmax, Fascist Daily, no self-respecting American news person would dine with Miller and Chris LaCivita and Stephen Chung or their equivalents in the DeSantis campaign, or for that matter, their equivalents in the Biden campaign, not in the middle of a campaign, not the night before a debate. But these were not 12 self-respecting American news persons. They were 12 people from CNN and CBS News and NBC News and ABC News and The Washington Post, including management, who thought it was somehow appropriate to share a table with not just political operatives, but political operatives who constantly encourage the public to view news reporters as criminals who should be targeted and attacked and assaulted and kidnapped and tortured and killed. And among those who broke bread with these scumbags were Rick Klein, political director of ABC, political editor of Bloomberg, Mario Parker, David Shalian from CNN, Robert Costa from CBS, Shane Goldmacher from The New York Times, and, and here is the point, Kristen Welker of NBC News. As of next week, the new host of Meet the Press. And yesterday, the other shoe dropped. Quoting the Hollywood publication Deadline, Kristen Welker's first broadcast of Meet the Press on Sunday will feature a pre-taped interview with former President Donald Trump. The interview will take place on Thursday, that would be today, in Bedminster, New Jersey, and it will be Trump's first broadcast network sit-down since leaving office. Ooh, we got Trump to talk about himself. We're really cool, aren't we? Kristen Welker is the greatest host of Meet the Press ever. The network has stressed that the interview is not a town hall. Poor Chris Licht, I almost feel sorry for him. The network has stressed the interview is not a town hall and there is no live audience. And the same invite has been extended to President Joe Biden. The sit-down also will be accompanied by a fact check on NBCNews.com. The implication being there that the fact check will not be on Meet the Press. They also pointed to a quote that David Gellis, 
I believe that's how he pronounces his name, the executive producer of Meet the Press, gave to the Pointer Report, quote, we are in the business of covering politics. It's not our job to pick and choose the leaders. The American people get to do that. And so our job is to make sure that the American people understand who the people in power are, what they stand for, and what they plan to do. Not to get too biblical on you here, but I believe that exact quote was also said once by Pontius Pilate. It's not our job to pick and choose the leaders. Our job is, yeah, it's not our job to try to stop an arsonist who's lighting the building we are all in on fire. It's also not our job to try to put out the fire. We are just here to make sure that the pyromaniacs and the firefighters get an equal amount of coverage and the equal opportunity to either burn or not burn everybody alive. Congratulations, NBC, on destroying Kristen Welker's reputation before her first show. Just brilliant. This is a preliminary verdict. I reserve the right to edit this sentence out later. But honest to God, right this minute, I actually miss Chuck Todd. By the way, this Meet the Press EP, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but I recognized it. David Gellis, G-E-L-L-E-S. He was one of the producers I inherited when MSNBC hired me back and canceled Phil Donahue in 2003. And by the way, they canceled him because the show cost way too much money. And it had a live audience with a union in New York, which cost way too much money. And even without Phil's admirable anti-war stance, they were going to cancel it. His stance just made it happen faster. Anyway, so we kept about uh, half maybe two-fifths of Donahue's staff and made them into the countdown staff. And the others were dispersed around the company. And this guy, Gels or Gellis, was one of those dispersed. But don't worry. Since that day, 20 years ago, he has burnished his credentials. We can trust him to handle a Donald Trump interview on NBC News with a rookie. We can handle that because he burnished his credentials by going on to produce such journalistic enterprises as Rock Center with Brian Williams and, of course, 17-time Peabody-winning program, Jake Tapper's Book Club. Christ. Also of interest here, profiles in discourage. Mitt Romney says he's going to retire at the end of his term, and we have lowered our collective American standards so much that God damn, you'd think it was Daniel freaking Webster striding out of the Senate in July of 1850 to take over as Secretary of State in the time of great crisis. Jesus H. Christ, it's Mitt Romney. This is the guy who put out a public statement with a big, colorful graphic that mocked me, me, for calling Trump a terrorist. And then three months later, there he was, a virtual hostage inside the Senate, inside the Capitol, because guess what? Sportscaster boy over here was right. Trump was a terrorist. And Mitt Romney, in October 2020, didn't effing know that. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Okay, this is half postscripts to the news and half things I promise not to tell. Mitt Romney yesterday managed to announce his retirement from the Senate at the end of his current term and to promote his authorized biography excerpt appearing in The Atlantic on the same day. Sums him up, really. The man who will forever be remembered for one photograph, with him cowering at a poorly lit table at the Jean-Georges restaurant inside Trump Tower weeks after Trump was elected, having gone there not for the frog's legs but to kiss Trump's ass. Yes, he is saying it's time to leave the Senate. 
Time to go, Mitt. Actually, Mitt, that was when you were running for the Senate in 1994 on the sure I'm an utter mediocrity, but check out my hair platform. Has any seemingly intelligent man missed more obvious things in American public life than Mitt Romney has? Other Vichy Republicans colluded with Trump out of evil. Mitt Romney did so out of naivete. An excerpt from this upcoming book, which I think they have entitled, They Call Me Mr. Mitt. Maybe I dreamt that. Maybe it's Mitt the Elder. Quote, what bothered Romney most about Josh Hawley and his cohort was the oily disingenuousness. They know better, he told me. Josh Hawley is one of the smartest people in the Senate, if not the smartest, and Ted Cruz could give him a run for his money. They were too smart, Romney believed, to actually think that Trump had won the 2020 election. Hawley and Cruz, quote, were making a calculation, Romney told me, that put politics above the interests of liberal democracy and the Constitution. No kidding? Seriously? Mate, it took you through the 2020 election to realize that Cruz and Hawley were con men? That maybe there were Republicans who were exploiting Trump? Seriously? Early in 2021, Romney also told the author, quote, a very large portion of my party really doesn't believe in the Constitution. Did you meet Nixon before he died? <laughs> Mitt, did you figure that one out for yourself? Or did you have one of your old teams from Bain Capital do it for you? I always thought Mitt Romney was a ditz, but even I was shocked on October 13th, 2020, when a graphic appeared on social media. White letters, all caps, some of them red on a blue background and his name at the top. And I read it innocently enough, no idea what was in it. And boy, did I get a surprise. That, as I reported that day, was when I discovered that apparently I was the shadow president of the United States or something like it. Quote, I'm troubled by our politics, Mitt wrote as it has moved away from spirited debate to a vile, vituperative, hate-filled morass that is unbecoming of any free nation. Mitt, you just noticed that? That had been happening since, like, 1990. Started by Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh and those other fascists. The president calls the Democratic vice presidential candidate a, quote, monster. He repeatedly labels the Speaker of the House crazy. He calls for the Justice Department to put the prior president in jail. He attacks the governor of Michigan on the very day a plot is discovered to kidnap her. And yet, Mitt, there you were, running away from your own commitment to stop this fascist would-be dictator, dining with him, auditioning for his cabinet supporting him as he railroaded a Supreme Court nominee past the very rules your party had made up out of thin air in 2016. But go on, Mitt. Quoting this thing again from October 2020, Democrats launch blistering attacks of their own, though their presidential nominee refuses to stoop as low as others. Pelosi tears up the president's State of the Union speech on national television. Keith Olbermann calls the president a terrorist. Media on the left and the... Wait, what? Pelosi tears up the president's State of the Union speech on national television. Keith Olbermann says the president... Huh? Trump, governor of Michigan, Biden, Pelosi... Olbermann. One of these things is not like the other. I just want to clarify here. I am not affiliated with any political party. I don't work for any news or commentary outlet, and I have not been elected to any office since, let me see, junior year of high school. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. As one Twitter respondent to Mitt Romney's unfortunate missive, the former Obama spokesman and Pod Save America co-host Tommy Vader said... It's long past time to break ground on a both sides museum in Washington, D.C. This comparison of the president of the United States to Keith Olbermann must be preserved for future generations. I agreed then, and I agree now. Honestly, soon to be ex-Senator Romney, I was the best you could do? Or from the other vantage point, I was the worst you could do? 
Mitt Romney, you are one of the Franz von Poppins of this nightmare, our equivalent of the German conservative politician who helped to get Hitler elected and then said, don't worry, quote, within two months, we'll have pushed him so far into the corner that he'll squeak. You, Mitt Romney, helped to enable a terrorist to occupy the Oval Office. And by that date in October 2020, we all knew Trump was a stochastic terrorist. Maybe you didn't. Terrorism by proxy, he praised the white supremacist militia terrorists in Michigan, repeated their demands, and the next thing, as you put in that graphic, they were scouting out the governor's summer home and planning to kidnap her. And Trump tacitly endorsed the paranoid, delusional QAnon cult. The next thing you know, one of the Kool-Aid drinkers were bursting into a kid's pizza parlor, brandishing an AR-15 because he really believed that bullshit on a psychotic chat room board. That had already happened. And Trump was already also a direct terrorist by October 2020. Senator, what was he doing to his own supporters, if not terrorizing them? He told them a Democratic president if elected, would burn down the cities and destroy the suburbs and eliminate the borders and allow foreign gangs to come kill them. All that, Senator, is and was and was then terrorism. And you, Mitt, you didn't notice. The country was metaphorically ablaze and you were yelling at those of us who were trying to warn people and put out that fire I referred to earlier. We have to make it safe for both the pyromaniacs and the firefighters, NBC News, Washington. You tried to make it bad for those of us who were warning people in the realistic terms by complaining that we trampled some imaginary tulip garden of friendly American political discourse that still exists only inside your own head, under all that hair. Silence in the face of evil or both sidesism in the face of evil is the same as conducting the evil yourself, Senator. Trump was there. Trump was still there because you and the other good Republicans let him stay there. This is the kind of America they wanted. This is the kind of America they got. This is the kind of America you got. If you have complaints about the state of political discourse in this country, Mitt, take it up with the terrorist in chief or with your own mirror. Quote, the rabbit attacks kindle the conspiracy mongers and the haters who take the small and predictable step from intemperate word to dangerous action. Mitt Romney wrote in October 2020 in his memo to uh, me. It is time to lower the heat. Leaders must tone it down. Leaders from the top and leaders of all stripes, parents, bosses, reporters, columnists, professors, union chiefs, everyone. The consequence of the crescendo of anger leads to a very bad place. No sane person can want that. Unquote. You'll notice that among the people he told to tone it down in October 2020, Mitt Romney did not include Donald Trump. And sure enough, less than three months later, Mitt Romney was avoiding a Trump mob bent on killing him or whoever they could get hold of, and by the way, destroying democracy. And guess what, Mitt? I was right. Donald Trump was a terrorist, and Donald Trump is a terrorist. Unless, Mitt... You think that I caused January 6th, idiot. done all the damage i can do here thank you for listening countdowns come to you from our studios high atop the sports capsule building here in new york new york here are the credits most of the music arranged produced and performed by brian ray and john philip chanel they are of course the countdown musical directors all orchestration and keyboards by john philip chanel the guitars bass and drums by brian ray produced by tko brothers other beethoven selections have been arranged and performed by no horns allowed 
The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, and it was written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Musical comments by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Jonathan Banks from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And airplane. Everything else is pretty much my fault. That's countdown for this, the 982nd day since Donald Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Convict him now while we still can. By the way, Mitt, he's still a terrorist. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants and my throat permits. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.